That was the first movement of George Ligeti's Sonata for Unaccompanied Cello. It's a very beautiful piece that is like a love song, and it, the music comes from uh, influences such as Renaissance music and folk music, and it's called a dialogue. And you probably noticed uh, me playing a lot of double and triple stops, two and three notes at the same time, as well as in imitative voices, um, which uh, have a conversation with each other. So um, it's a very beautiful piece. Sometime I hope to play also the uh, wonderful capricious second movement for you, um, but that will have to wait for another time. Um, I would like to answer some of your questions now, uh, questions from the audience uh, that you presented uh, the North Shore Chamber Music Festival. Um, uh, I, I, we always love to hear from you because um, you know we're on stage presenting our music, ex uh, experiencing the music, uh, reflecting on our our lives and and what our own personal experiences bring to music and our knowledge but we very much like to hear what goes through your minds 
when you're listening to us. And so I have uh, the two questions that have been presented and I would like to comment on them. The first question is, uh, somebody said, the cello has often been considered an instrument that is most closely uh, like the human voice. In your playing, have you ever been influenced by any of the great vocalists? Um, well, I would say a resounding yes, and I would go even farther and say, if you haven't heard any of the greatest singers, um, it would be very difficult to make a convincing singing sound on your instrument. Uh, the cello, to start with the cello, um, it's, a, it's obviously a, a, a very diverse instrument, a very beautiful, very soulful instrument, and it covers the entire range of the human voice from the bass uh, to the soprano and all registers in between. Um, and it's uh, if, if we as cellists think of the human voice and with all the uh, as a potential source for different sounds and colors, um, we can uh, it, it, we can use the human voice as a guide to to produce such uh, variety on the instrument. Um, and s since most instruments historically were considered uh, to uh, look to the human voice to be uh, the ideal of what to try to uh, resemble or may or imitate, so to speak, you know, up until at least through the time of Mahler. Um, this is an, uh, a clear thing we try to do. And so um, in my education, um, I've looked to singers such as Maria Callas, uh, Elizabeth Schwarzkopf, uh, Fritz Wunderlich, Dietrich Fischer Dieskau, um, in more modern times, being uh, principal of the Cleveland Orchestra, I've had the privilege of playing, uh, accompanying such singers as Nina Stemme, and um, and many others. Uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, I I learned so much from playing with great singers. Another one, Simon Keenly side that comes to mind, who's who's absolutely stunning. Um, and so uh, it, yes, I mean listening to the greatest singers can only uh, add more complexity, more variety, uh, and and also teach you how to make different types of singing sounds, whether it's, you know, your, your lyric soprano, your coloratura, your dramatic uh, tenor, what, whatever it's going to be, so that you have those sounds in your arsenal. So that's a very good question, and um, it's something as instrumentalists, and not only as a cellist, but I think instrumentalists across the board are thinking about. Um, the second question that was presented was, was this. Over the span of your career, you have been principal cello of the Cleveland Orchestra and solo cellist of the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra. In your experience, what are the main differences in style between European and American orchestras? It's a very good question. I used to get this question a lot uh, when I was playing in the Bamberg Symphony and living in Germany, especially as an American. I think the answer to this question uh, is in two parts. Uh, one is cultural and the other uh, is in training. And I would like to start with the training. Um, I can't necessarily speak for Europe as a whole, but I can certainly speak a little bit for Germany having lived there um, and played in one of their top orchestras. Um, in Germany, they actually have um, programs, of academies uh, to train musicians uh, orchestrally. And I would say one of the striking things about these academies is they really want each and every cellist uh, handling the instrument a certain way, uh, a certain approach to the instrument, a certain approach to music making, a certain ideal c concept of sound. And, um, and it's not that you're making clones or something like this. I mean, the we're not robots. Your individuality as a human being is going to come out. We're all different. We all have different personalities. But um, the, the point of this type of training is to create a more homogenous type sound. Um, and so that 
there is uh, the utmost um, blending of the tone. And so uh, to really create a real, uh, this type of beautiful transparency and quality to the sound. And if everybody is handling the equipment in similar fashion, you're going to get quite a blend that way. So that's the, the real positive aspect of this type of training. In America, of course, we have uh, you know, conservatories and, and even historically schools such as the Curtis Institute of Music, which was known for sending you know, instrumentalists to the Philadelphia Orchestra, the Cleveland Institute of Music, historically also sent a lot of players into the Cleveland Orchestra and functioning, you could say, similarly in that fashion. But the difference in America is that um, perhaps each or, or the students may not be asked to handle the instrument in a very specific way necessarily. Um, it, it's more of an individualistic uh, society and therefore what we're looking for probably in an American orchestra is you know in a sense we don't care you know how you handle the instrument or, or you know if you're gonna hold if you're a violinist you're gonna hold it over your head and put the bow this way of course that would be a visual distraction but the point is if the sound matches if it fits in the orchestra if it sounds good if, it, if that person communicates in, in a way that helps the group. That's what matters. And I would say in terms of sound, the difference is this homogenous sound. Well, perhaps I would, could best put it this way. Um, you could compare it uh, like having a, a Hamburg Steinway or a New York Steinway. A Hamburg Steinway is going to give you this bell-like quality, uh, richness, but transparency throughout. And the New York Steinway is going to give you a more textured sound throughout, uh, both the highest quality, but but a, a real difference in tone quality. And I would say, uh, in general, uh, a, a European orchestra. I think in the sound world, you can expand that to other European countries. There's yes, there's more of this homogeneous approach versus the American, which is a, a, a society again that's more about the individual, but coming together to make the highest level ensemble just like you know i play in the cleveland orchestra it's it's an orchestra that has one of the highest levels of ensemble playing in the world but it's so it's it's sort of like um you have a, a mountain you're going up and you have a goal at the top and you have one group of people going up the mountain on this side and another group going up this side uh heading for the same goal perhaps um that sheds some light uh, on the differences in style in orchestral playing between European and American orchestras. Um, so, so yes, this it's it's a fascinating subject. Music is is something that we experience. It's something we're constantly learning about. It's endlessly fascinating to think about, and it's something that's absolutely essential in our lives. And so with that, I would like to thank you for tuning in and to wish you the best in health and happiness in these unusual times and to keep living and stay safe.